So how difficult is it to create a self-replicating assembler, self-replicating machine that builds copies of itself or builds more complicated version of itself, which is kind of the dream towards which you're pushing in a generic arbitrary sense? I had a student, Nadia Peek with Jonathan Ward, who, who for me started this idea of how do we use the tools in my lab to make the tools in the lab? Yes. Uh, in a very clear sense, they are making self-reproducing machines. So one of the really cool things that's happened is there's a whole network of machine builders around the world. So there's Danielle and now in Germany and Jens in Norway. And um, um, each of these people is has learned the skills to go into a fab lab and make a machine. And so we've started creating a network of super fab. So the fab lab can make a machine, but it can't make a number of the precision parts of the machine. So in places like Bhutan or Kerala in the south of India, we've started creating super fab labs that have more advanced tools to make the parts of the machines so that the machines themselves become even cheaper. So um, that that is self-reproducing machines, but you need to feed it things like bearings or microcontrollers. Sure. They can't make those parts. But other than that, they're making their own things. And I should note as a footnote, the stack I described of computers controlling machines to machine making machines to assemblers to self-assemblers, view that as fab one, two, three, four. Hmm. So we're transitioning from fab one to fab two, and the research in the lab is three and four. At this fab two stage, a big component of this is uh, sustainability in the material feedstocks. So Alicia, a colleague in Chile, is leading a great effort looking at how you take um, forest products and coffee grounds and seashells and a range of locally available materials and produce the high-tech materials that go into the lab. So all of that is machine building today. Then back in the lab, what we can do today is we have robots that can build structures and can assemble more robots that build structures. We have finer resolution robots that can build micro-mechanical systems. So robots that can build robots that can walk and manipulate. Mm -hmm. And we're just now, we have a project at the layer below that where there's endless attention today to billion dollar chip fab investments. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, a really interesting thing we pass through is Today, the smallest transistors you can buy as a single transistor, just commercially for electronics, is actually the size of an early transistor in an integrated circuit. So we're, we're using these machines, making machines, making assemblers to place those parts to not use a billion dollar chip fab to make integrated circuits, but actually assemble little electronic components. So have a fine enough, precise enough actuators and manipulators so, that allow you to place these transistors. Right, we're, that's a research project in my lab on called DICE, on discrete assembly of integrated electronics. And we're just at the point to really start to take seriously this notion of not having a chip fab make integrated electronics, but having not a 3D printer, but a thing that's a cross between a pick and place makes circuit boards in 2D, sure. Um, the 3D printer extrudes in 3D. Mm -hmm. We're making sort of a micro manipulator that acts like a printer, but it's placing to build electronics in 3D. But this micro manipulator and, is distributed? So there's a bunch of them or is this one centralized thing? Oh, so th that's why that's a great question. So um, I have a prize that's almost but not been claimed for the students whose thesis can walk out of the printer. Oh, nice. So you have to print the thesis with the means to, to exit the printer and it has to contain its description of the thesis that says how to do that. It's a really good, uh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a fun example of exactly the thing we're talking and, about. And I've had a few students almost <laughs> get to that. Um, and so um, in what I'm describing, there's this stack where we're getting closer, but it's still quite a few years to really go from us. So there's a layer below the transistors where we assemble the base materials that become the transistor. We're now just at the edge of assembling the transistors to make the circuits. We can assemble the micro parts to make the micro robots. We can assemble the bigger robots. And in the coming years, we'll be patching together all of those uh, scales. So do you see a vision of just endless billions of robots at the different scales, self-assembling, um, self-replicating and building complicated structures. Yes, 
and the but to the yes but is, let me clarify two things. One is that immediately raises King Charles' fear of gray goo, of runaway mutant self-reproducing things. The reason why there are many things I can tell you to worry about, but that's not one of them, is if you want things to autonomously self-reproduce and take over the world, that means they need to compete with nature on using the resources of nature, of water and sunlight. Mm -hmm. And in light of everything I'm describing, biology knows everything I told you. Every single thing I explain, biology already knows how to do. Um, uh, what I'm describing isn't new for biology, it's new for non-biological systems. So in the digital era, the economic win ended up being centralized, the big platforms. In this world of machines that can make machines, I'm, I'm asked, for example, um, you know, what, what's the killer opportunity? You know, who's going to make all the money? Um, who to invest in? Mm -hmm. But if the machine can make the machine, it's not a great business to invest in the machine. <laughs> Um, in the same way that if you can produce, if you can think globally but produce locally, then the way the technology goes out into society isn't a function of central control, um, but is fundamentally distributed. Now that that raises an obvious kind of concern, which is, well, doesn't this mean you could make bombs and guns and all of that? The reason that's much less of a problem than you would think is making bombs and guns and all of that is a very well-met market need. <laughs> Anywhere we go, there, there's a fine supply chain for weapons. You know, hobbyists have been making guns for ages and guns are available just about anywhere. So you could go into the lab and make a gun. Today, it's not a very good gun and guns are easily available. And so generally, what, you know, we've run these lab in war zones. Um, what we find is uh, people don't go to them to make weapons, which you can already do anyway. It's an alternative to making weapons. It, coming back to your question, I'd say the single most important thing I've learned is you know, the greatest natural resource of the planet is this amazing density of bright inventive people whose brains are underused. And um, you could view the, the, the social engineering of this lab work as creating the capacity for them. And so it, you know, it, in the end, the way this is going to impact society isn't going to be command and control. It's how the world uses it. And it's been really gratifying for me to see just how it does.